Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. I am speaking to the founder of Rocketworks and the man behind DayZ, the one and only Dean Hall. How you doing, man? I'm too bad. Pretty good. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So first thing I wanted to ask is how much of serving in the military influenced video game design for you? Um, quite a lot. I, I think uh, maybe not necessarily so much on the design front, but definitely on the development front. You know, when you look at its core, uh, military is about people and making games is very much about people more so than many other industries. So if you look at a factory or um, you know other industries I've worked in, well, people are always an, an important part of it. Um, and making video games, it really is just people at computers that make video games. So a lot of the aspects of how we do that were actually surprisingly transferable. Oh, right. Okay. That makes sense. And in terms and of a lot of a lot of the military is about training people as well. And that was really where the idea from Daisy came from was, you know, how can we train soldiers? How, particularly, how can we get emotional responses out of soldiers to, for, for training to work? You, you have to not feel like it's real, but you at least have to tug some of the emotional thought processes that you have. Because how, how long was the idea or how long did you have it before you kind of really started to implement it and do something well, I think with like it? a lot of good ideas, uh, you know, I, 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 you're, you're familiar with Carl Sagan, the um, uh, astrophysicist and oh, like yes, cosmologist. Yes. Yep, yep. Um, so I really like Carl Sagan and he's got that uh, saying of, you know, if you want to invent an apple pie from scratch, then you must first invent the universe. And, and I think if you look at a lot of good ideas, it's really hard and you know, big products, it's really hard to look at them in isolation. And actually there's a sequence of events, of many other things that lead up into it. So if you look at day Z, it wasn't just the idea of, um, of the individual parts of it. In fact, there was really pretty much no original part to that. It was really taking a bunch of non-original stuff and then assembling it in a particular way. Uh, so, you know, database, stuff like that. The actual core code of putting it all together occurred in about a weekend, um, but all the pre-work of taking different parts and understanding the engine and um, getting a database connecting in with it, that was over many years. Right. Did you foresee that it would become the big thing? And in a, in a way, it's the stepping stone to PUBG and Fortnite. Yeah, um, according to PewDiePie, you know, and he's a pretty reputable source. So, <laughs> um, uh, I, um, no, not initially. So initially when I was making the mod, um, I was taking together a bunch of other stuff I'd done and I had two ideas I wanted to work on because I had a group of about 150 friends who were in a little gaming group and I would make mods for them and then I'd release them to the community. And I guess I was a reasonably accomplished modder in the armor community. So, you know, people would try my mods and stuff like that. And um, when I was making it, I figured a few people would play it. Um, and then I approached a gaming group called ShackTech, who are very popular in the military simulation community and the armor community. And I'd been working with one of the guys there because I was working on armor three at the time. And I said, hey, you should check out this mod. And he was like, oh, we're not doing anything this weekend. So sure, we'll get our gaming group. And it was about 50 of them to check it out. And it, 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 when they played it, I knew it was going to be big then um, uh, because it just hit on all the right buttons. And that was when I started, basically, from that moment, I started preparing for um, the success of it. Because mm. obviously, it seems like it's become a bit of a gift and a curse for you, right? Because obviously, you you, may, you got a lot of wealth from it. Um, it kind of really put your name out there. But yeah, there, there's all this, I don't know if you'd call it rumors and Chinese whispers online that they people feel you abandoned it and and all this stuff. I mean, it's crazy how much, like, how toxic some of the the environment can be. Um, I don't know whether I'd ever go so far as to call it a curse. My worst days now are nothing like my worst days in the army. So, well, of course. Yeah. Uh, like, everything's relative. Um, um, I don't think I could call it a curse any more than any kind of success is a curse. Um, so I don't think it's any different than winning lotto or... Um, 
or, or any other kind of you know, windfall or something like that or, or sudden success um, can throw a, a few existential crises in there. Um, but I think, um, you know, online hate in general and gamer, you know, anger is, is no different from many other communities as well. Um, you get that kind of everywhere, you know, the Twitter sphere and stuff like that. So oh, yeah, it's, totally. it's, it's sort of something that we just have to navigate and for, uh, for society in general. So I don't think, um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, boohoo, but yeah, it's not, it's not, um, it sucks sometimes, but uh, I think you have to look at it. Well, and, no, nobody relative. likes, nobody likes criticism, right? So I'm just, I'm wondering if I do, I like criticism it just needs to be valid. So definitely. Okay, so, so the, cause there's a difference between con- constructive criticism and just hate. Right. Um, I think sometimes you'll find some of the thing I find some of the things that hurt the most are the things that you think might be a little true. Um, and so I think learning to know, okay, that, thing that that person said really bothers me is that because it's a little bit true or is it just because it's completely wrong and it could be one of those two things but i think sometimes people have said things maybe not very nicely um and it might still be mostly wrong but sometimes the part that really hurts in it is that you're worried it might be a little true well you don't even know how people are saying it when they write these things right because everything can be misconstrued when it's through text so i think do you go down the rabbit hole and just look at comments or do you just of course stop? You do. Like, I'm, here's, here's my, um, here's my two rules for social media. Uh, the first is never take anything personally. Um, and the second rule is realize you're going to take everything personally. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, there's a lot of parents and stuff who they're like, Oh, I don't want to expose my kid to social media. Social media is so terrible. Um, that's, that's the same as saying money is terrible and I don't want to expose my kids to money. Money is how we buy stuff and trade and stuff like that. It's a huge part of our society. Social media is the same. It's here to stay. It's a form of currency. You get famous on TikTok. It is a quantifiable commodity that you can turn into real exposure and reach. And as we have learned over the last four years, if you have a platform, you can even use that, uh, you know, social media platform to become president of a country. So um, for better or for worse, social media is here to stay and it has its impacts um, at whatever age you're at, whether you're a teenager dealing with, you know, online hate um, at your school through social media or whether you're a movie star or a game developer getting some online hate at stuff as well. Mm. But your time in the military, did that kind of prepare you psychologically for that, though, when you started getting no, no, criticism? Not at all. No? no, no, definitely. You were no. just all good anyway. Well, it's a whole different thing. And I think that even if you look at society in general, we're still adapting to what social media is. Um, mm. And it's very easy to tear stuff down. People are like, oh, social media is terrible, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, it has its bad parts to it, um, but it also has its good parts as well. And I think, you know, the evolution we're going through as a society is to figure out, okay, how do we how do we use this without destroying ourselves, which we tend to do with every technology, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So when you start a gaming project, what's what's mm-hmm. the first thing that you do? Do you focus on the game mechanics first? Do you focus on the scope or the visuals or the story? Uh, I think for the, me, the big thing is to figure out what are the pillars of it? What is that core of it that needs to be true? So starting a video game project is about making a whole bunch of assumptions and then you need to sort those assumptions you need to sort the assumptions into these are the things that must be true and then you sort some of them into these things that probably should be true and then things that i'm going to assume now but i don't know and that gives everyone the ability to build a scaffold around the game there is some stuff that when you start a game project you say must be true because you have to build, you have to start building, assuming that's going to come through. So with our game Icarus, you know, one of the big ones is um, saying that the base survival mechanics are enjoyable. So that's something we said that must be true. If it's not, then the project will fail. Um, So, you know, basically sorting those things out and, and figuring out what is the things, the pillars that must be true with our project. And then you start, on those immediately to test them and make sure those are true. Kind of like a scientist following a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been working on Icarus for now? Um, So it's, I guess, been in full production for about a year and a half now. Um, The the broad design may be about six years. 
yeah, but sort of on and off. Um, I don't like to pick up a game idea until I've and develop it until I've until I'm sure I know how it can be built. Right. So were the ideas for this f- way before Ten Cent were even partially acquired Rocket Works? Definitely. And, yeah, yeah. and look, I, I think you know we have something we often say in video games is ideas are worthless. They're completely worthless. Um, and I think this is a big mistake people make um, either at the starter industry or from the outside. It's not about having a good idea. It's about the concept. So how how can that idea be brought to life as the key thing? You can take a relatively boring idea um, and have it sell really well. It's really on how you build it. The how is, is critically important because vi- making a video game is like taking a five-year IT project and saying, hey, we have to do it in two years. So the how you make it um, is super important. Right. Okay. So when's, when's the plan to have this finished by? Um, we don't release our internal dates, but it's 2021, um, right. which is this okay. year. So, um, and I suppose we don't really think about in terms of done. So, you know, we're looking at what is that, not early access, but what is that core of the concept that we can deliver? And then how can we um, change that going forward? So if you look at any of the good games like, you know, Apex or Fortnite or stuff like that, they don't release the game and forget about it. Um, you release the game and you develop it over time. You make add different modes to it. Um, you know, change some of the game mechanics, add new content. That's all quite rightly expected by consumers nowadays. And it's a cool part because it means that you don't just have to figure everything out at the start. You just figure out the core of the game and then you build on it with the community. Mm. What about the environment in terms of the design there? Because obviously it all came to a head last year in 2020. If you think of cyberpunk, right? And crunch and mismanagement and putting out a release date that you couldn't meet. So has this, has that incident uh, instance kind of influenced anything there or you're just kind of like, okay. Well, uh, first, of, first of all, I want to ask you, do you think cyberpunk was a success, success or a failure? Well, yes and no. Well, I suppose, uh, but in the short term, maybe not. But in the long term, it might be okay. Like you mm, think of no, safe answer. I like yeah, it. I no like man's it. Um, no man's sky. Like same sort of thing, right? It released and it had kind of. Buggy. But look, you know, no man, no man's sky made a fortune, and of cyberpunk made many fortunes. So. Um, uh, it's difficult, really, um, to swing it as anything other than a resounding success. Will it hurt CD Projekt Red in the future? I don't think it will. I don't think so. I don't think at all. I think if you look at Bethesda and um, they release great games and cool games, but they're buggy as, as anything um, yep, on release. Um, and look, I think hopefully it gives people pause in terms of chasing those day same day releases for console. I think it's clear that the product had real problems on the legacy consoles. And I think that was their big mistake. I I think on the PC, sure, there were some bugs, but my friends at least have, you know, most of the bugs are kind of funny more than, um, and and, that was kind of expected from The Witcher and they were doing a game with such scope. So I think it will have reverberations there. Um, But, you know, if people throw around, oh, hopefully we don't make a cyberpunk, I'm like, well, you know, they made a lot of money. Well, yeah, that is true. That is true. Yeah. Uh, okay. So like in terms of, I wanted to ask this actually, but the, about your time in the military, mm. like what was the difference between serving in the New Zealand military and in Singapore, for example? Well, I was, I was on exchange program. Um, so uh, I was during my, I've done my officer training several times. So when I was in the Air Force, I did it and then I left. And when I went back, uh, but I joined the Army, the Army were like, mm, we want you to do your officer training again. And I think they thought I was going to turn down the officer of service because most people wouldn't want to go spend another year digging holes in Wairu in the snow. Um, but I was like, sure, that was what I wanted to do. Um, so I went and did my officer training again. About halfway through that, they were looking for someone to send on an exchange program to officer training in Singapore. And so, you know, you, you go there, you wear their uniform, you do their training um, and everything. And it was a massive culture shock. Um, very different. They're a, a conscription army. 
so they have national service, which is a whole different ball game than you know trying to get into the New Zealand Army. It's very, I'd imagine, it's even more difficult now um, to get in. Uh, very competitive, especially for officers. So our officer training course in the Army started with like 60 people and about 30 people, maybe less, graduated. Um, so And that's just getting wow. on officer training. So 50% of the people who start officer training uh, fail either by getting kicked out or – um, or, ha- or you know, injury or something like that. And I remember we had an officer on exchange from Sandhurst in the UK, and um, she described it as a um, uh, an uh, a year long officer selection course. What we do here, rather than necessarily an officer training course, um, just because it's it's so tough. Um, and yeah, if if people want to be in your military, if they want that job, you can use that as a threat. Um, to get them to do what you want. But if they don't want to be in the army, uh, you have to do a whole bunch of other stuff. So like, uh, you know, when we were on exercise and stuff, uh, the DS, the directing staff, your instructors, they would go around with laminated, they're called MD717s, which is the number for a form, military has numbers for all its forms, for requesting a release from the military. So they would walk around with laminated versions of these um, and they just, it'd be like two o'clock in the morning. You've been awake for days. You're hungry. You're cold. You're tired. You're looking at the desert road in the distance. And um, you're doing, you know, you're just feeling awful. They would walk around with them and they'd be like, hey, you know, it could all be over. You could just leave right now. Um, you could sign this, go down to the CP, the command post, have a coffee with us, and then just leave. So <laughs> they're really trying to psychologically test whether you really want to be there. And that's after you finish the training. That's, oh, sorry, after you finish selection, that's actually you're, during your training, they're really just trying to mess with you. Oh, wow. Okay. And was that ongoing? Like, did you still ongoing, get that? All the way through that. Yeah, all I guess, the way through. So, so I didn't, um, the last six months, obviously, of the training in New Zealand, um, I didn't get to see in the army because I um, swapped mine to do the um, officer training in, in Singapore. But I did do the Air Force officer training um, quite a while ago now. Um, and, uh, um, and, uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was, it was a similar sort of thing. The, the Air Force officer training was quite different from the Army officer training, which makes sense because, you know, they're quite different roles. Um, yeah, but it was very psychological and it was very tough. And, um, a lot of it's really about finding that motivation. You have to be very motivated. You have to really want it, which is very different from a conscript army where most people don't. And I think that was what surprised my course mates most. Um, they were all sort of basically having to do this, and here was me volunteering for it. Mm. Well, I suppose, did you apply a little bit of that when you were going up Mount Everest? I think I apply it to everything, and and I think if there's a criticism I have of most New Zealanders, I think they lack a lot of discipline and motivation. I agree. Um, We're one of the least productive countries in the OECD, Um, but that's not... That's not an entirely good measure. I don't think um, I fully buy it. But I definitely think that as New Zealanders, we could use a lot more discipline, a lot more motivation, um, for sure. Um, I, think it's, I think it's due to uh, a lesser amount of competition, right? If you think of Asian countries like China and India, there's so many people. It's so cutthroat. You have to kind yeah, of step on people I do think they go top. in the other direction. So I'll give you an example. Oh, yeah, they from do. My, yeah. my course mates in Singapore, I remember, uh, you know, we were cleaning the – bathrooms or something and someone had knocked over uh, a um, jug of um, rifle oil um, you know so you know oil that you use to lubricate the rifle right so there's all this oil all over the floor and and of course I'm with what was called the JC batch so the junior college batch so these are um, the supposedly the best of the best, the smartest in their year in Singapore during their national service would become officers. And so they're trying to clean it and they're just mopping it with mops with water on them, just moving it around. And I'm sitting there going, how many of you, I remember asking them, I was like, how many of you did chemistry at high school? You know, and you know, nearly all of them put their hands up. And I'm like, did you not learn like, you know, you need to break an oil down with soap? I mean, I didn't even do chemistry and I know that. Like, 
I would say most New Zealanders, by the time they get to 20, know that if you want to remove an oil from anything, your hands, the floor, anything, then if you introduce soap, it's going to break the you know, lipids down or whatever. And, you know, it's fat and oil. It's, we just know that stuff. So I think, you know, a lot of times they lack that common sense because they were so focused on their book smarts. And I think that's something New Zealanders are really good at. I, I do think we have this generalist. You even saw it in the military. I remember we had this uh, American... Um, uh, you know, person come over from the American military and you know, he was a master sergeant and his job was to change the port tire on F-16. And, you know, we were sort of joking. We were like, oh, what about if you cha- had changed the starboard tire on that? And he got kind of offended because, yeah, there was a guy whose job was that. And um, we were like, okay, what about if you get promoted? And then, you know, he gets promoted. His job is to train people to change the port tire on F-16. So they were very specialized because um, they have so many people. We're not, you know, we're just a little – um, country. Um, and so I feel like we're really good as generalists. Um, but I think a lot of people could do with a lot more, you know, focus on discipline and finding that internally and, um, and you're being prepared to take risks. Um, you know, if you want the rewards, then you need the discipline and you need to be able to deal with the consequences of it. Mm. What's your view on the government investing more money into gaming and esports? Because film gets seems to get all of the money or a majority of it when gaming is bigger than television and film combined. Yeah, feel- well, look, there's, there's many aspects to it. The first is, and I suppose the least controversial um, and the least I have a personal in, um, investment in is um, streaming. So I, I really think right now New Zealand on air should be funding um, Kiwi streamers and YouTubers, at least partially. So if you look at the demographic around, say, 14 years old, they are not watching television. Do you, do you even have, do you have, like, can you get terrestrial television? I haven't watched terrestrial television in, like, 10 years. I yeah, don't even know. I'm the same. I, I don't even, even have if, an aerial at my house. So, yeah. I, I, don't, is, I don't even, is there a cable? Is there some way? There's probably some way I could plug it in. I have no idea. For me, it's like Netflix or YouTube or something like that. Yeah. So, and it would have been over a decade since, I've had anything to do with uh, terrestrial, you know, television in terms of watching it myself. Um, so, you know, and that's me, and I'm like 39. So, if you look at a 14 year old, they're they're that's not they're not consuming that. And I think the one thing I like about things like New Zealand on Air is let's have Kiwi kids seeing other Kiwi kids, or you know, and, and having Kiwi role models and and stuff like that. And I, I, so I really think that New Zealand on Air should be looking at, um, for a relatively little mo- amount of money, sponsoring some content, um, you know, sponsoring, you know, content from, say, you know, Pacifica community teams and, and, and maybe, uh, you know, it's just so that we don't have a, a bunch of very homogenous American um, streamers that our, our kids all, all look up to as idols and stuff like that. It'd be great to see some... Uh, um, yeah, some other representation, particularly Kiwi ones. Yeah, uh, on the other side of it, um, I actually don't think I'm – I don't have enough confidence to advocate that um, the government should put money into gaming. What we all – our expectation is so low that we just don't want them – funding our competitors so we a number of our staff probably like 10 15 percent are ex weta digital so uh you can change quite easily between at the specialist level between the video games industry and the film industry which means that we are in direct competition with weta digital for um staff now if you want to make a movie um do do you want to make a movie you're going to make a movie I'm no. not making a movie. It's You're too hard. Making movies? I okay. made short. I've made short films. I've made short films. Got it. Well, if you want to, you get twenty percent of what you spend back in cash. Um, and Treasury hates this, right? And that's what all those documents got released. Treasury's like, oh my god, it's uncapped. So if you spend a billion dollars making a film, New Zealand taxpayer will give you two hundred million it's cash. Not a not a tax not a tax rebate just cash on the money you spend. Um, and um, so that means when you think about it, the film companies are being subsidized 20%. Um, and when we compete for those staff members, that makes it very tough for us because we get no 
um, grants, no subsidies, no tax rebates, no nothing. Mm. Um, so, so really, uh, what I would like more um, is um, them just not to fund our competitors. Now, I think I'm realistic about it. I think if you removed that um, that rebate, then less films would be made here. So, I don't know what the answer Definitely. is, and frankly, it's not my job to figure it out. But definitely, we're very negatively impacted by that. My gut feeling is Treasury hate it because it's uncapped, so it means they can't budget for it. And I suspect the politicians probably hate it too because how do you justify it? It's pretty simple. When you look at it like that, it's like, okay, that's really bad. We're giving those people money, but we're not giving these people money. And so they're going to be able to easily get the more talent. Um, and, and also those film companies, they don't exist in New Zealand. We're a New Zealand company. Um, we pay tax in New Zealand um, at our parent company. Does Miramax, you know, does Paramount, do they pay, um, you know, taxes here? No, they don't. So um, I, I think it's a no-brainer for them, but it's also very difficult for them to get rid of it. Um, Have you had yeah, these conversations with uh, any Again? politicians at all? Have you had any conversations with politicians at all? <laughs> um, not really. You have some I'm probably. <laughs> uh, no, I'm I'm pretty uh, outspoken, um, so I'd imagine if I was a politician, I probably wouldn't want to talk to me that much, because um, uh, you know we we have really great staff, I think, who are maybe play the politics game a bit. I'm I'm a little too jaded and a little too, um, uh, you know, I, I can I guess say what I think without consequence, and so I tend to. So I'd imagine that it's probably not a uh, yeah, I, I'm not expecting any visits from Jacinda Ardern or um, Judith Collins anytime soon. Let's just say that. <laughs> Fair enough. But we do look. We do talk with some politicians and stuff like that, and I, I well, try. You know, I just give them right? light hard ribbing. Everyone's yeah. connected somehow, usually. <laughs> so how how did things change at Rocketworks uh, once Tencent uh, acquired part of the company? Did anything not change much, really? The atmosphere it was just exactly the uh, same. Exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. Yeah. No changes. Pretty much. They just help. No different. They help. What? Just a little, a little bit more money. Mm. Right. Which, which was put into Icarus. I, They've still I got don't... a minority stake, um, so it's not a majority. So they can't um, control the board or anything like that. Um, yeah. Um, and um, they're, I don't know, people are weird online about them as a company, but they've just been fantastic to work with. Uh, I kicked tires with a lot of different people looking for some shared DNA. And they, uh, everyone I dealt with there, I just kind of got it. Um, certainly at the senior level, maybe not at the junior level, but any time I talk to any of the executives, you just, you know, when you talk to some people and they're operating at a level and you're just like, yep, no, they just get it, um, you know, and, and uh, they got kind of what I wanted to do, you know, to push the genre, to take those risks and stuff like that. Um, I think there's probably not many people in the world, um, not many organisations that are funded to be able to take those kind of big risks. And, you know, I'd sort of sat down and thought about with my what I wanted to do with my life and I figured I didn't just want to coast off into the sunset. I wanted to take, to take some big risks. So, I, you know, that wasn't something that, say, New Zealand investors even had the money to do, let alone the appetite to spend that money. Mm. Is there expectations that you put on yourself or any pressure you feel mentally to kind of emulate what Daisy was with Icarus? No, I hope I don't emulate it. I hope we do much better. So I think, um, you know, I, I think uh, overall, considering it was my first time dealing with it, uh, I did pretty well with Daisy. But um, I, I think that I would be very disappointed if I approached uh, any future project the same way we did there. I, I think every time you do something big like that, you get better at it, right? I'd imagine with you with, you know, podcasts, what the podcast, the type of episode that you might have produced when you started out would be very different from, say, oh, your yeah. expectation from it now and including your fans as well. We grow and and we change and hopefully we move forward. And, and so I think for me, yeah, this is just entirely different approach, which makes sense because Daisy was like eight years ago. Yeah, for sure. But everyone, you're synonymous with that game, right? When people say D for Hall, now, you're only ever as now. good as your yes, last game, for now. right? Yes, yes and, that is true. And um, you look at James Cameron. I can't even remember what his first movie was, but you know, people um, uh, definitely the same with video games. You're only as good as your last game, and and so I think, yeah, we've got a very good team here, um, and this is definitely the most fun I've had um, making games ever. Um, just the, the quality and the caliber of people we've got is sort of incredible. Because how's everything been in terms of managing everything with COVID and lockdowns and all of that? 
Has it affected uh, the day to day? A nightmare. Um, definitely a nightmare. Um, I definitely wake up and so we closed our Series B um, funding with Tencent um, in like January 2020. So I, I wake up with cold and cold sweats sometimes about what would have happened if. Um, I suspect we probably still would have closed it, but but you know, so many. What I think people don't realize is um, people don't spend lots of money without eyeballing something even really rich people don't buy stuff through text message or whatever um when i bought my car they were like this is the first time anyone's ever bought this car through tech because i just bought it through text message and that you know people normally want to come in and see stuff um i didn't realize this they do you know and and so if someone's going to give you you know 10 20 million dollars they're going to want to see you and, and so I think this is something that definitely our industry has been grappling with. Normally, you would do these deals, these big deals at game conventions. Maybe you wouldn't close them there, but definitely the negotiation, you'd do a presentation, you'd show games, you'd shake some hands, you'd go out to dinner, you'd talk, all those kinds of things. Very human, very human things. So I think even though we've become this uh, electronic you know, society, uh, you know, we can do a podcast like this and it's not an issue. But if, you know, if you were going to give me $5 million, $10 million to make a game, you probably want to go out to dinner and talk about it at the very least um, and just eyeball each other. Um, and and so I think that makes it very challenging to develop high-level partnerships. I think if you look at the partnerships that are being done now during COVID, they tend to be existing partnerships, people who already have a relationship. Maybe we've already made a game before um, and published one. Um, yeah, so I think we're, we're going to see that play out over in our industry over the next few years. It'll be fascinating to see. And we won't know how it's affected everything um, until, yeah, it's, it's all played out. Yeah, well, I suppose it makes it hard to manage everything when you don't know how long this is going to last, right? In terms of borders being yeah, closed. Yeah, look, we, we were lucky initially. Order. So when the first lockdown hit was right at, basically we were at our most well-defined milestone. Um, it was called Woodcutting Simulator, I think, or it might've been on the back of that or a cabin building or something. So um, basically it was, we had a really clear idea what we wanted out of that milestone. And I think we had about 40 people at that time, maybe a little bit more actually, and um, on the team. And most people had been working on the team for a wee while. So everybody kind of had figured things out. We knew exactly what we needed to do, was well-defined. Um, everybody had their tasks and then boom, the lockdown hit. We actually saw it coming from miles away as well. My brother's uh, used to be one of New Zealand's experts on influenza. Um, he's a virologist oh, wow. um, who studies viruses. Um, now he studies B viruses. Um, but um, so, you know, science kind of run in our family and, um uh, and, and so I knew a lot about influenza a long time in advance. And I think when it was when the um, quarantine happened for Wuhan, I knew at that moment, I knew it was coming to New Zealand. And we implemented some very strict systems. Um, we actually got all the ex-military people who worked at my studio together in a room. And we developed a, a staged plan for dealing with COVID. We used color levels. Um, and as we moved through the different color levels of severity, what was going to happen um, all the way through to our black level, which was basically societal collapse. We were warning people that black, we might not be able to pay them because um, the banking system had gone down, stuff like that. Um, so, so we were, were quite well, well prepared. We stockpiled PPE. Um, very early on, we actually taped and said, right, if you, you know, as you're coming into our office, if you cross this line, you must wash your hands. We had people um, physically observing, people would wash their hands. When it got to the heightened time just before the lockdown, we had actually implemented that um, there were only periods of time you could come into or leave the office. So if you um, there were very short periods of time when you could come in and once you'd come in, you had to stay there and we were providing people food um, and stuff like that. So that helped us survive things um, because we definitely would have got destroyed um, as a company. It was just, we, we, you know, we haven't been around long. We don't have a lot of cash reserves from previous products. So um, it was critical for us to not be disrupted by it. Oh, Wow. And, you know, and people thought we we're a bit crazy. And, and you know what? My big thing is cybersecurity now. And I think that people scratch their heads sometimes at some of our cybersecurity practices. And I think it's the, the same kind of people who thought that everybody was re overreacting over COVID. I think if you actually look at things pragmatically and you realize that um, 
while past behavior and past things are good predictors for the future, they're not the only predictor. I think you have to look at everything clean and, and stuff like that. If you look at what happened with the NZX and the Reserve Bank, cyber cybersecurity is a massive, massive risk that I think literally every person and nearly every company is massively underestimating the impact it can cause them. Yeah, so as a person who's ex-military, it has a brother that's a virologist. Like, how do you think that we handled it and how other countries... We got lucky. You, we got oh, lucky. Pure and simple. We got lucky. At the start, we got lucky. I remember me and a friend of mine who works here who's, who's ex-military as well, and we were just despondent that I, I would be walking, you know, I live in the viaduct. And so, you know, I'd walk along, um, uh, you know, the front uh, here and the big, the cruise ships were still docking. And I was like, this is crazy. We're just, we are so badly prepared for it. And, you know, the government is, they need to close the borders now. And they did. And when they did, I was like, oh, I think it's too late. And, and, and I, I think that, I, I think since then, actually they've done pretty well and people, um, you know, knock it in that, but uh, I think initially we got lucky, and then um, and then it was really good leadership with some some beautiful, almost New Zealand style screw ups um, from that point. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, just went through sheer naivety. Um, uh, you know, uh, not testing the <laughs> MIQ workers was a was a yeah like, that was a epic lol, fail. that was top kick there. So. Um, yeah, uh, I think we got lucky at the start, really, mm. pure and simple. And we've basically heard words to that effect from Jacinda uh, Ardern. I've heard it in, in a subtle through. way. So they yeah. acknowledge that that um, I don't think they initially thought that um, eradication was possible. They they had probably been advised that that was not likely um, because you know there's that sort of at least two week delay before you find out how bad it was. I think we just got really really lucky then, and then. You know, and that's the thing people would might say about Daisy, same thing. Oh, you just got lucky. Sure, there's luck in there, but it's being able to capitalize on the lack, uh, luck and plan and planning on success as well. New Zealanders are really good at planning and um, thinking about what might happen if they fail, but you actually need to have a plan if you succeed. And I think if you look at the government's COVID strategy, that's what I like about it. They did they think that eradication was possible? Probably not. But they planned for that it might be because that was the only option. We didn't have enough ventilators. We didn't have the um, – you know, we were very spread out but urbanised as well. Um, so we didn't have the capability to deal with it. So they were like, look, eradication is uh, – you know, I'm a big fan of Interstellar. Do you like Interstellar the movie? Oh, I love Interstellar. Yeah. Uh, so what is it that he says um, to Tars? He's like, it's not um, – Tars is like, it's not possible. He's like, it's not possible. It's necessary. Very, yeah. And I, I like to think that's how uh, – you know, Jacinda was in a meeting then, and she was like, it's not possible. It's necessary. And, um, yeah. So I think planning for the success, even if that success is improbable, is important. Hmm. It's a good way. I, I like that you you look at it that way, and I think it's, it's, it's very viable. Um, My biggest issue with New Zealand lawyers and accountants is they are atrocious at giving you advice on risk to the point that they're almost worthless. So I think if you're starting a company or doing anything um, that's not a dairy farm, that's not a company that already existed, you need to have advisors that are outside New Zealand. Um, I would say almost without exception, our um, accountants and lawyers are trained to tell you everything that's wrong with deals. And that is almost useless to me. I, everything we do is extremely risky. Um, and we know that. And yes, it is useful to have people to help us navigate that risk. But we have to make a decision. Um, and, you know, uh, this is something, and look, we're, we're, we're definitely the lawyers and the accountants we work with now, I think, have come around to that. But I think even they sometimes have had to beat them around a little bit um, and say, hey, hey, you, your job is to help us make a decision, not to just tell us what everything is wrong. And um, that's, I think, uh, uh, it comes back to that problem I see with New Zealand. I think we're really bad with failure. And I, I think if there's one program I wish the government had, I call it a, we need to have a national conversation around failure. And I think that we don't do a good job of introducing our young people to what failure means. Um, I, I think it's even a factor in our high suicide rate. Um, you will fail at things. Um, 
uh, I, you know, I, I, they, I'm sure with your podcast, you've had failures, you've had despondent moments. And, um, you know, how many, I don't know how many times you might have tried to do something like this before you succeeded. Um, and um, I don't think people, I don't, I don't think we're good at training New Zealanders to do that culturally. Look at how we treat our sports teams when they fail. We forget about them. We rip them off and rip them to pieces. Um, we don't, you know, you look at an American, all, all, all Americans are like displaced millionaires, right? They all think they're millionaires. They're, 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 they're going to really. be the next millions. You, know, you catch an Uber in LA and your Uber driver is going to tell you all about the next script that's going to be huge that they're writing or, you know, they're trying out for this part. Um, I just think we're really bad with the idea of dealing with, we're so risk averse that it actually hurts us. Um, and we, we take failure as a personal front and we stop trying. Which is it's, a, just it's, a, a it's amazing you've said that because I just spoke to uh, a venture capitalist from LA last week and he said he, he gets pissed off with the whole tall poppy syndrome here and people are scared to fail and he says it's the worst thing um, oh, it, and it, it can just, destroy I, entrepreneurs. If there's one thing that I really hate about New Zealand culture, it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than tall poppy. I, I think it's a fear of failure um, and I think we teach it. It's not that we're not teaching people strategies to deal with it. I think we actually teach it. I think if you – my biggest criticism of NCEA is that. I think um, we do everything we can to avoid the word it's failed. Um, and it, probably the most surprising thing I find when dealing with people is they seem to be incapable of dealing with failure. When I've had to cancel projects, often I've left it so long, I, I, you know, and I walk in and I finally have to tell them, guys, we've failed like spectacularly. It's so obvious. How can it not be obvious to you? I think recognizing when you failed at something is critical to succeeding at something. If you cannot recognize what failure looks like, you will never succeed at, at all. Um, there's just, uh, uh, there may as well be a law of the universe like gravity or whatever. Um, and um, I think we are just horrendous at it as a, as a country. I, I think the people who succeed are because they don't buy into that part of the culture. Um, and I definitely, you and know, you don't, you clearly don't. I don't. And, and that probably means I get on reasonably well with Americans, but I can seem very abrasive to you, your average New Zealander. Probably, but oh well, you've been probably all so many different parts of the world, right? So you've seen different cultures, so you probably have a better understanding and a more aware of it. You know, if you're confined um, confined to a little bubble, you don't know, well, you don't know what you don't know, right? But so. everyone has their bubble, and I do as well. And and I, I'm not sure I necessarily have much in common with myself even ten years ago. So that's the thing: we're really products of our environment, right? Um, and um, the challenges and difficulties I face are very different to the challenges and difficulties that my past self faced. So I don't think I can necessarily even understand, you know, who I was back then. And I think that applies even to, to other cultures and that. But I, I definitely think that there's a lot I love about New Zealand. And I think you can see that in full force with how we tackled 2020. And, you know, you have Gabe Newell, you know, Valve CEO saying that, you know, New Zealandism or whatever is, a, uh, you know, is exceptional and, and almost a tradable commodity. But I think that um, if I think that we're not, we're doing nothing with that at the moment, no, almost nothing. Um, you know, we, we, we could be selling New Zealand for like, enormous amounts of money, you know, by, by offering, um, able to bring people in. It's like when people get mad about, you know, as a Peter Thiel or whatever, who got citizenship, I know he's not a very nice person. Um, you might not like him or get on with him and people are like, Oh, it's terrible that someone can get a, uh, you know, residency if they invest 10 million us in the country. Well, that's awesome. It's probably only going to cost the country a hundred thousand or whatever for them to have ever been part of it. And we are a net positive 9,900,000, you know. So um, I, I think sometimes New Zealanders just be a little bit more pragmatic and, and also decide what do we want. If um, we, we tend to half do things in half measures a lot. That's why I really like this building we're in, Commercial Bay. It was a real like, and I love working with Precinct. Um, there's real forward thinking. They're like, you know what? We're going to build a giant building. It's going to be amazing. We're going to do it here. Um, and we need a lot more of that attitude in New Zealand uh, if we want to have good jobs for young people coming through, which we don't have enough of. Mm. Did you manage to, have you managed to uh, meet up with Gabe 
while he's been here? Pick his brain? No, no, I haven't. Our COO did. Um, yeah. Um, mm. I, I, haven't, I haven't met up with him. Okay. I was wondering if you'd want to pick his brain and get ideas or anything from him. Um, look, I, I mean, I think there, again, it's it's like, uh, you know, me suggesting. I actually met uh, Microsoft CEO once um, when I was on stage at um, Xbox, and I just said hello. I mean, what do I have in common with him again? Uh, like, um, you might be surprised. Running, um, probably, well, maybe things in common, but, but you know, like, he, what does he have to gain from asking me a question? He's living a whole different life and just at different points. And, and I think that... Um, uh, you know, look for looking for answers is important, and I definitely think there's a lot of things you can learn by looking at stuff. And I do a lot of reading and a lot of introspection in, in terms of how I can do things better. But there's a lot of people who work at the company here that I that I learn a lot from as well. Um, yeah, mm. very roundabout answer to your question there. That's that's all right. That's all right. In in regards to Icarus, was I, there I any... think you know a CEO that I I look. Um, uh, to, to a lot is uh, in New Zealand CEO. Like I think um, he's he's copped a lot of flack for what he did during um, during COVID. But um, yeah, I think that um, yeah, he he's been a fantastic. I think. In like, regards to uh, Icarus, was there any mm-hmm. games or any particular thing that influenced that in terms of, as you were designing it? Were there any things that you took something from. So I know, I know would say like Zelda Breath of the Wild, they took influence um, from Skyrim, for example. And I think with the second one, they're getting influenced by Red Dead Redemption 2. I would say that um, our game has pulled a lot from Skyrim and Ark. Skyrim in terms of atmospherics and some of the survival mechanics and stuff like that, in terms of how it makes you feel, how the environment makes you feel, I think that was our benchmark for how the environment we wanted it to be um, and a level of quality that we were bringing. We really wanted to to really up it even almost to that Red Dead level. Um, so, you know, uh, and that's, you see a lot um, behind me there, just really going through the art style and everything and hand making things and just doing trying to, to just make it feel as awesome as possible. And then I think on the mechanics front and how we go forward with things, we really look to games like Ark and how could we take those and make them better. Really just took the five awesome uh, survival games and tried to take the best um, parts from them. Hmm. What do you think the hardest part of game design is? From the start to the finish, what do you think the hardest part is? I think a great game is more about what you don't put in it than what you do. So it's about deciding what not to do. That's the hard part. Uh, if you just take a whole bunch of mechanics and just keep adding to things, particularly if you're making a survival game, it becomes unworkable um, and just a mess. Um, and I would argue that that's arc a little bit. It's just a bit of a mess. It's, you know, you got. I remember playing um, a while ago, and there were like dodos with party hats on them, and like um, that dropped birthday cake. And um, it's a true story. There's unicorns. There, you can get lasers that go across your T-Rex. And I'm like, what is any of this? And and I think that that's the danger. If you approach uh, your video game as, hey, let's just smash the mechanics in, um, I think that's lazy. Um, I think, you know, that's what I like about multiplayer and I like about what we've done with Icarus. We've said it isn't about fancy cutscenes. It isn't about a, a flash story or any of this stuff. It's about the mechanics. Those base mechanics in the game need to be amazing. Otherwise, no one is going to play it. And that's a bold thing to do, but I think it's important. Um, it's like when a filmmaker makes a film in one room or something, you know, as their set. It needs to be a really good room. I'm th- trying to think of that Tom Hardy movie where it's basically just him in a car, I think. And it was a good movie. How do you, you know, just really challenge to make a really good movie where it's entirely set inside a car, yeah, as he's driving along. Yeah, yeah. So how do you know when to not, like when you know, okay, you, you might have all these ideas. It's like, okay, we're not going to put this in. Or do you put in the idea and then initially, and then you're like, nah, and then take it out. I think you have to play test. I think that's the big thing. So I think you, you absolutely have to, to play test as much as possible. Um, and um, don't think that you're super wise, um, unless you're making a boring, unless you're making, you know, Elder Scrolls 7. Um if you're doing something new, then I think you need to let your ego go a bit and your decisions should be made on playing the game. Hmm. Well, I just want to say that uh, during lockdown, I 
I bought like a, well, I didn't buy, I downloaded this Doom modding thing and I mm -hmm. built like 30 levels of Doom and customized it. And it ob obviously like it was so difficult to do and it gave me a whole new respect for what you do and what game designers and uh, all do. It's so like, oh, I commend you, eh? Because it's, it's, there's a lot involved, so much involved. There is, but, you know, it's a team effort and I think that's what people miss. Um, I think it is possible to work on stuff yourself, but motivation and discipline are really hard. Um, and um, that's why I think if you're making it with someone else, when you have a bad day, they have a good day. You, you might be looking at your list of things you need to do and it feels like it's never going to happen and then someone adds a cool sound to your game and it just makes you inspired again and you you, you see you get the faith back you, you see that vision and that is a lot harder to do if it's just you um, and and if there's a few of you then you need to make sure that uh, you you keep each other's um, cups full and um, and that, that is tough, definitely. And, and, the, and the better and more experienced people you work with, uh, the better work they produce, which the more exciting things become and the more possible things seem. They're definitely the group that are, I'm working with here, uh, the most expensive group I've ever worked with, but also the most talented, which which definitely is, is every day is awesome like yeah. that. Because how big is Rocketworks now? How many, how many people do you have? I don't know, like 70 <laughs> something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's my COO's a... job to know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think there's like 67 on site here in Auckland um, and another sort of 10 or so in Dunedin. Mm. And then a few remotes as well. Cool. Well, hey, um, I know I know you got to get going. So um, thank you so much for doing this. So if anybody wants to follow what's what's happening with Rocketworks and, and all that, what's the best place? Was the best Probably to Instagram. Go. Um, uh, I mainly use Instagram now. I've kind of. What do you use? What's your social media? Uh, I use Facebook, Instagram. Those you, are probably my Facebook. Nice yeah. Seriously. Wow. Well, You're hey, dead to like, me. a lot of. <laughs> well, like Messenger of, or or. Oh well, or like, to be to be honest, I just I use Facebook to promote stuff, but I don't actually use got it. Got it. Okay, okay. Yeah, but and then I use Messenger to message people, but I don't actually scroll through it go down the rabbit hole got it um, no no minion memes for you then <laughs> no no so it's basically facebook instagram i do use twitter uh as, as well but twitter seems to be more americanized i feel i don't know yeah heaps, yeah um, heaps of TVs yeah. that use twitter mm -hmm. yeah um, I, i'm i'm not really a fan of twitter i probably twitch is my biggest growth area probably because it aligns most with what i do of course um um, and you know, other than that, I use Instagram. So Twitch is probably a great place, although I'm mainly streaming um, basically as a, as almost a hobby to learn a bit about streaming. So I, I stream um, dev streams of me making a little game um, that's not Icarus, but we will start streaming Icarus. Otherwise, I think our uh, there's like survive um or you can find it on Steam and wishlist it. Um, but I think um, people will know when it comes out. It'll be um, splashed all over everywhere, I'm sure. So, of course, um, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you it'll won't be, be this year. To... Sooner rather than later, let's say that. Okay, so what, before mid-year? First, first six months? Maybe. Maybe? That's a good answer. Definitely in the – definitely by the last bit. I think the thing is we have, uh, want to avoid um, – uh, disappointing people and, course, and i think that's yeah. the the problem you can get into like cyberpunk did so i think for us um we've got a quality level um that we want to hit and no matter what happens uh, you know our hard our limit we, we won't release it unless it's hit that we'd rather remove functionality from the game than break that and once we've hit that then we'll give serious consideration to the release plan yeah well what's that saying that shigeru miyamoto says um a delayed game is eventually good. A bad game is forever bad. Oh, mate, it depends why you're making the delay. Um, every game always could use with an extra 12 months. For us, if we overdevelop the game without getting exposed to our players, that'll do a disservice later on as we look at what are the new modes we can add, uh, the new things we can add to the tech tree. Um, so I definitely feel like we're at the point where the game is ready to be exposed to players. We've got enough of the mechanics in for it to be a core game that people can enjoy. If you look at Fortnite, you know, they're adding new modes and stuff like that. That's because people have been playing it. So now it's about getting the quality bar for that. That's a good reason to delay a game, to get the mm. quality bar right. Good to know. Well, Dean, hey, this has been a pleasure. Thank you awesome. so much for doing this. 
Uh, that's the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe, and uh, stay safe, and make sure you follow Dean, Rocketworks, Icarus, as, uh, yeah, they're, they're good, they're great, they're amazing, actually. Uh, yeah, and I look forward to seeing it for myself. All right, that's the show, everyone. Stay safe.